Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Miller. I'm the editor of Bloomberg Live. So um, it's my team that, who puts on uh, the programming that you see at this event. And we're really happy to have you here at this lunch, which is inventively titled, ETFs Pass Another Test and Why It Will Never Be Enough for Critics, uh, which uh, we're really thankful is, is sponsored by Invesco QQQ. So I'd like actually to introduce John Farron, standing over here who is a senior regional VP of Invesco uh, to kick off this discussion. Thank you. OK, well, thank you. And I, I want to thank everybody for attending uh, today's lunch. Um, when, I was, uh, when I first saw what the, the title of the session was going to be, I think a much easier way is ETFs, real news versus uh, fake news. And, um, <laughs> and uh, so I thought that was you know, probably a, a pretty good analogy. But when I think of the QQQs, you know, when I, I think of the true Mount Rushmore of, of the ETF business, um, I, I think of the Q's seventh largest ETF um, in the industry, 66 billion in assets, second most widely traded ETF in the business, uh, almost 6 billion notional traded per day. But what many people think of when they think of the Q's, they think of is it a proxy for the technology market to get efficient exposure to tech, which it is, but many people are not aware that 40% of the queues is actually in non-technology companies. So I think a more accurate description of the queues is really exposure to companies that are really looking to disrupt their respective markets. So when I when I think of Apple and I, you know, there's a billion of these floating around the world, they're trying to create um, they're trying to make this in, into a credit card, and that's their entry into the credit card processing business. When I think of Tesla, are they an automaker, or are they a technology company, or are they a company that wants to send us to the moon? You know, when I think of Amazon and Netflix, are they streaming services, or are these companies now competing for Oscars? So, you know, really, um, the queues are a way to gain exposure to the companies throughout the world that want to really disrupt their respective markets um, in search of profits. Um, why I think also this session is, is very um, timely is as ETFs continue to gather record amount of flows, we're hitting record levels. Um, when I, I think of the volatility that we saw earlier this year, um, that ETFs were tested, um, maybe is that a sign of, of how ETFs are going to perform when this bull market eventually does take a step back. So um, when I think of a, a Mount Rushmore of ETF professionals, of ETF executives, I think everybody on this panel um, really needs no introduction. But for, uh, for the sake of, of introducing them, we have uh, Reggie Brown, Senior Managing Director at Canna Fitzgerald. We have Todd Rosenbluth, who's a Senior Director and Head of ETF and Mutual Fund Research at CFRA. We have Linda Zhang, who is the CEO and founder of Purview Investments. Um, she's also one of the founding members and board members of Women uh, in ETFs. We have our own Eric Polikov, who is the global head of ETF Capital Markets for Invesco. And we have um, Bloomberg's own ETF guru, uh, Eric Balchunas. So with that, I'll turn it over to Eric to, to moderate. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, we're going to keep this real casual. Normally, I'll wait till the end for questions. But honestly, if you have a question, just raise your hand, because we only got about 30 minutes. It's an informal crowd here. You're enjoying your food. So since we've already got the introductions out of the way, um, I want to bring up this uh, slide here, which is the top 10 attacks on ETFs. This is all from last year. Actual headlines. Um, and as an ETF analyst, I always have, every time one of these comes out, everybody forwards me the article and says, did you see this? So I'm constantly having to defend ETFs, even though um, I don't run an ETF, but I, people always think of, of me on this. And so the volatility in Q1, I think, was a test. Last year, Brexit was a test. So that's why the name of the panel is about this, because look, ETFs are definitely reshaping the whole ecosystem. So we need to make sure they work for everybody. So Reggie, let's start with you. You're in the middle. You're making everybody's orders happy. Uh, you, see some, you see these kind of headlines. W what's your reaction? Do you get involved in trying to push back on this? Is there any merit to any of these? Uh, no merits whatsoever. <laughs> of course, I'm going to say that. Look, ETFs have 28 years of empirical evidence 
in all market conditions around the world how they behaved. And ETFs, nothing more than mutual funds with benefits that trade on exchange. And you know, looking at some of the narratives in the marketplace, some of it is competitive from uh, other vehicle types, namely mutual funds or hedge funds, but it's about price, outcome, and performance. And I think you're seeing uh, change behavior that uh, has a lot of people concerned around business models. So ETFs perform uh, in a way that uh, deepens the engagement to different investor types. And the narrative on the board here is a lot of hype. I would add, so uh, my intro was I had a ETF and mutual fund research at CFRA. We, we do both. <laughs> there's, a, there's a role for both ETFs and a role for mutual funds in someone's portfolio. There's only certain strategies that exist in an ETF that don't yet exist, or that only exist in a mutual fund that don't exist in an ETF. But the way that we analyze those funds is almost the same thing, what's inside it. So if you own those stocks that was referenced earlier by John, you own Apple, you own Netflix, but it happens to be in a Fidelity mutual fund, is no difference than if it happens to be in the triple Qs, other than you're paying a lot less for that ETF. And if you want to sell or buy it at 1.04 PM, that trade is being executed. It doesn't matter the vehicle that, for where it is, but no one's writing an article and there's no headlines that say that Fidelity is going to blow up the equity marketplace. In fact, it's more what's happening to Fidelity because all the money is leaving those products and going into ETFs. That's a good point and a riff to this slide here. Well uh, in, he didn't, number 10? We couldn't see on the right. Oh, number 10 was there hideous. That was uh, Jim Cramer. <laughs> he doesn't really have a reason. He just hates them. He does. I, um, uh, this is a slide of the Fidelity Magellan Holdings, and I think Todd brings up a good point, and this is a, uh, a, a scenario I get, and Eric, I'll turn over to you. Yeah. Mutual funds were never blamed for the uh, dot-com bubble burst thing, were they? No, they weren't. Um, and here you have a lot of stocks that look a lot like the S&P 500, a slightly different order. Are, is this just really a format change from, say, something that's closet indexing, yeah. or even if it is true active, to just something that's similar for a cheaper price, and it's not like a people are rushing into some asset class or sector, but it's more format shift. I, I agree 100%. I think you know at Invesco, where we manage both mutual funds, actively managed, passively managed mutual funds, actively managed ETFs, passively managed ETFs, we manage just under a trillion dollars worth of, of client assets. And around 24, 25% of that now is actually tied to passively managed products. And if we think about the evolution of just investing um, you know, in 1976, the first mutual fund gets born out of, out of you know, Malvern, Pennsylvania. I think about the ETF wrapper as truly just a different piece of technology um, that offers people like what Reggie just you know, commented on, more tax efficient, more transparent, which I think is a huge piece of it, uh, generally at a lower cost because of multiple things that are, are eliminated from the, the plumbing or the piping of ETFs versus mutual funds. So ultimately, at the end of the day, Right or wrong, ETFs give access to individual investors to express their opinion intraday on over 2,100 asset different classes now being covered within the ETF ecosphere. So again, I think it's really just an evolution of investing, and it's really the next wave of technology. Now, Linda, um, you're, a, uh, you're familiar with the quant community. There's a lot of active strategies being converted to ETFs. Um, just everything that was just said, what's your thoughts on, on, on any of those uh, attacks? Are any of them valid? Um, if you were running an active mutual fund, would you consider any of those to be a concern? Yeah, um, <clears throat> her view is a user of um, ETFs, so I, I might be the only person who represents the user side of it. Uh, I, is this on? Can you hear me well? Okay, good. Uh, so, <laughs> so w w you know, I, I look at all these, right? I mean, I, I grew up in the, com the old communist China. Clearly, uh, ETF is not worse than that. The, the Marxism. <laughs> That's my next slide. Uh. Front runner. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I. I, I so, so let me t let me throw that to you. This is a look at will passive lead to Marxism, which is what Sanford Bernstein famously said. If you want people to read your research report, just throw Marxism in the title. By the way, yeah. that thing got more attention than anything I've ever written uh, times ten. But if you look here, the. BlackRock and Vanguard are the top two owners of 86% of the stocks in the S&P 500. I think that's what got people a little freaked out. They're like, are BlackRock and Vanguard basically going to take over America's companies, and then will CEOs get a free pass? W what do you say to that? 
Yeah, I, I think that you know, Marxism, the, the only part I can see the analogy actually is on the better side. Uh, ETF is a vehicle, right? It, it, it's a vehicle just as mutual fund is a vehicle. They're both 40 act funds, but, but ETF is a newer vehicle. It's the Teslas of the world, right? It, 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 because all the benefits, you know, the, 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 my fellow panelists were, were talking about. So what that means is it, it provides, it democratizes access to investment. So we have ETF on those active contents, right? We have ETF that, that mimics hedge fund. And, and those product strategies uh, previously are not accessible to everyone. So in that sense, ETF is, is, is democratizing access to, uh, to, to investments to, to every, uh, every individual. Eric, can I, can I just <coughs> piggyback onto that, onto that slide as well? What that slide, which is well presented, hides is that Vanguard's equity, actively managed equity mutual funds hold some of the same stocks as the Vanguard 500 does, uh, to use Invesco as the example. There's active managers that are doing it in addition to the artist formerly known as PowerShares that, that has <laughs> those products that are in it. The same thing with, with, with BlackRock for what it is. So the assumption is all this money is going into the same exact funds that track the same exact strategies to use, again, Invesco on it. They own S&P 500 stocks through low volatility and high quality and momentum. And those are, some of those are overlap, but in many cases they do not overlap with one another. Not every fund is owning Apple in the same proportion and is sitting on their hands not doing anything about it. There, there's, a, there's a lot of gray area in this. And Eric, I don't want to front run you, but I mean, with the research that we do at Invesco, and we actually, my team actually is out there proactively talking to investors about the effect ETF has on the U.S. equity marketplace. And according to our statistics, if you add up just ETF equity U.S. assets, as well as mutual fund U.S. equity assets, yeah. passively managed only, okay, yeah. it's only around 9% of the Russell 3000 index. And we like the Russell 3000. It's a little bit broader than the S&P 500. It kind of you know, gets you down to some of the smaller mid-cap stocks. So I'll front run you there, but go ahead, Eric. See that white bar? <clears throat> that is U.S. equity ETF assets. And the blue bar is the size of the stock market. So I think that chart kind of diffuses a lot of it. But I think... I think, um, Reggie, one of the things that gets people concerned is in a mass sell-off. So this is a chart I bring up. This is SPY. It's 25 years old, speaking of Mount Rushmore. This would be the George Washington, I guess. Um, this thing's lived through a lot. You've been there the whole time. Talk about some of these days. Those are days that I circle where it traded over $60 billion in a day. Now, keep in mind, Apple trades about $4 billion a day. So $60 billion in a day. Are these the kind of things that you would argue are a test, a test that was passed? And was there any problems in, in, the, in any, of these, uh, any of the trading? Well, I think if you were look at a graph of SPIDER, SPY, for example, you'll find that uh, ETF issuance or shares outstanding tends to be the highest when the market has a higher correlation <clears throat> to itself during a massive correction of some sort. And um, ETFs have passed that test over periods of time where you had high volatility and mass marketplace uncertainty around outcomes, political or, or economic. And so if I think you look at the long horizon and the peak periods, ETFs do not guarantee you uh, risk around principle, but they do offer uh, liquidity around uh, times we needed most. ETFs were born from the 87 crash. Yep. There was a government study that said we need a mechanism that will offset uh, imbalances and uh, out came an ETF format based on a government study, empirical evidence. So you have uh, times of stress, big, uh, big days in, in market concern. ETFs perform a function, they've been tested, and give you outcomes that allow you to transfer risk at really reasonable prices. And just because an ETF is called newer, I would argue that point after 28 years in the marketplace, but because they're a newer vehicle in the market, um, they're point to as a point of entry for less informed investors that may uh, cause crowded situations, but they offer uh, a unique avenue of, of exposure through transparent mechanisms. So my argument to those slides, that narrative, and outcomes, let's look at the past 28 years of history, how ETS performed by asset class, whether it's uh, corporate equities, whether it's fixed income, both uh, investment grade high yield or treasury, or let's look at emerging developed uh, world to the United States and see how they perform. 
So I think there's a lot of evidence that, um, forget what I say or my colleagues on the panel say, what does the data say? And let's go there. Um, so speaking of that, here's a chart that people like, which just shows I added up the number of total trades in ETFs. The average trade size is $20,000. And there's been uh, $200 trillion worth of trades. So that's 10 billion individual trades. Now, there were known issues you can't even see on this other bar. There's been uh, maybe 30, 40,000 known issues. But let's talk about one of those days. Even though you can't see it, it exists, and that's August 24th, 2015. It's been a couple of years now. ETF started to trade at drastic discounts to their NAV. Everybody, it was the first like hour of trading. Sure. This is real. I mean, you had some plain vanilla ETFs involved, you know, yep. Vanguard. It wasn't just like XIV type no. stuff. Talk about that day and why people shouldn't be worried. No, I mean, <clears throat> again, as you pointed out, and this is fantastic, by the way, Eric. I, I would just opine that if you think about there are generally 252 trading days in a, in a single year. If, one, if there's an issue for uh, an hour out of the 252 trading days, like just put that into concept, you know, uh, uh, conceptually. So on that day specifically, without diving into a huge rabbit hole, which is very easy when we talk about this subject, if you just think about there were 13 US equity exchanges that are uh, listed that we can actually trade uh, an equity on uh, that, that morning. On um, that morning, one doesn't function like the other 12. And that's a fact. And there's just one that doesn't open up at 9.30 AM for their own philosophical reasons on why they, do, they go around that, 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 that methodology. And with that happening and them not opening up GE or other so large cap stocks that affect things like the Vanguard S&P 500 ETF, you as a, as a sell side participant like Reggie's firm you know, doesn't trust information. And if they don't trust information, they will do what? They will either not turn on their quoting engines or they won't, or they'll just open them up really, 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 really wide. And then, again, going further down to the rabbit hole, there are some things called limit up, limit down that causes things to halt once things move a certain percentage away from last sale. So again, you, you wrap all these things up into a four sigma event. It's not even a two sigma event, right? We're talking about less than, I would opine, less than a half a percent of a chance of this ever really happening. It happened. And then therefore, we've been spending the past three years talking about it uh, ad nauseum uh, to some extent. But I think, again, this is fantastic the way you put this. I always just think about for an hour of the trading day over the last three years, we had a severe issue potentially in, in, a, in an ETF ecosphere. Yeah, I mean, this chart's why they're mostly immune. But Linda, just <clears throat> real quick, you use them. Let's say it's a stressful day, right, like early February. Um, do you, if you're looking to get out or get in, do you have any advice on using ETFs in terms of how to uh, make sure you get a good price going in and out? Yeah, I, I can share the experience on the same day, you know, August 24, 2015, because I was heading an investment team at one of the largest ETF issuers, mm -hmm. Winhaven, right? So that day actually has very little impact on us, <laughs> right? So when market opened, uh, the, the futures halted briefly. A lot of individual stocks halted, right? So there's no way uh, to, to really price uh, some of the ETFs. Uh, and, you know, I actually, so, so what happened that day was we we have internal uh, we have internal system that would measure the the basket uh, the value of the basket versus the price right and when you don't have certain when s some of the the members in the basket were halted it, it's, it's difficult to price right so we knew that something abnormal is happening so we did not uh, it didn't trigger us uh, to trade. Um, and that lasted about 30, uh, I think it lasted about 30, 30 minutes, right? And the market yeah. came back. So, so I, I think for us, uh, it, it, for large users, it, it, it didn't trigger, right? Uh, but if you, you were just using mutual funds, right? Wouldn't have you, mattered. Yeah, it, it wouldn't matter, right, for intraday, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean mutual fund is a better vehicle, right? It, it, it just says, so, so if you're using, using ETFs, these things could happen intraday. Uh, but, but the best way to do it, not, not to uh, react uh, immediately. Yeah, um, well, I saw a, question, a couple. OK, so let's go.
Um, it, let, me, let me take, say, one quick thing and then pass it to Reggie in that I use Spy's volume as a new fear gauge. Um, if, you, if you track Spy's volume, if you put the VIX on this, it would look the same. Um, so I definitely think, I would say fear, but Reggie's right there and he can uh, elaborate. Okay, I guess my question is, who's fear? Well, I, I think, there's a couple things real quick. Um, backtrack. ETFs um, during stressful days account for 40% of the dollar volume on U.S. exchanges. So there's more um, related activity to ETFs on U.S. exchanges and is increasing over time. Is there a concern around that? That's an academic debate. I think to your question around, I see SPY volume going up, I think a lot of it um, over um, the last few years has been fear of counterparty risk. And you're seeing more listed derivatives, meaning options traded, or other types of vehicles being list, listed on exchanges that are being used, and so they're to reduce counterparty risk. So you have less swaps, you have less other types of instruments, and now listed options versus OTC options, and SPY is the biggest ETF in the world, and the most active equity option listed um, in the United States. So a lot of that is coming from other types of exposure, and that brings safety and comfort. So look, what we need here, resiliency and transparency. ETFs offer both of those. I would add just to, that's yeah. a good thing for everybody else that's, you know, that just wants to be able to get out at that same time. There's just more, the more liquidity, the more people in the room, they're not all gonna push out at the same time. They're gonna stagger when they wanna get out. There's gonna be somebody on the other side of that trade when you wanna get out which is exactly what you want to have. And then let me, um, let me try to come up with some legit concerns, just because we just, sure. I don't want to be too one-sided here. Um, this idea that ETFs could become too successful. And here's the chart Reggie was talking about. ETFs make up about 30% of the equity trading every day. What about this idea that it, because ETFs are so good, so easy, people start using them more and more than, than the underlying stocks? Could they vampire the liquidity out of the stocks and create at least incremental costs in the form of a premium uh, going forward for investors. Is there any danger to that? I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> not, I don't have a perfect crystal ball. I mean, I think for, for every buyer of an ETF, there must be a seller. Um, and then for not every transaction that occurs, actually it's about one-tenth for every 10 shares that trades, an actual creation of redemption occurs in the equity marketplace. You still need to be able to collect those individual securities. Someone needs to, whether it's Reggie's firm or somebody else's. Sure. Um, so they're going to have to go into the marketplace to acquire shares of IBM, shares of Apple, et cetera, to deliver to help create more shares of the ETF or vice versa. So I, I think that I don't think you're ever going to see a complete diversion away from individual stock ownership. And the way I also think about it, again, I work at an active and passive you know, asset manager. We talk a lot to our passively managed portfolio managers and say, listen, if you know that these, act, that, that the, excuse me, talking to the active passive portfolio managers saying, if you know that, act, uh, that passive is growing leaps and bounds, that should give you a better purview into the actual value of a stock. You can see how much BlackRock or Vanguard owns on the passive side or the active side. So again, those types of, I think they're clues for PMs on the, on the active side that they could, can actually be thinking about using for, for, for this, you know, this pattern that's going on. I, I have something to add uh, to that. With rise uh, of ETF that actually cause liquidity, actually I have a, re a pretty radical uh, uh, statement. Uh, I, I think <laughs> in certain situations, actually in most situations, um, the more ETF trades, um, the better actually there could be a liquidity buffer. I, I want to give you one example. Uh, we all remember August 24th, 2015. At the end of that year, December 2015, something else happened uh, that illustrated the point I was going to make. Uh, remember, oil price has been collapsing since 2014. By, by the end of 2015, it, it has actually made Third Avenue, right? They have a mutual fund focus a credit. They actually they were forced to shut down their mutual fund uh, because they couldn't meet the liquidation. Uh, investors' requests were for, for redemptions. But when you look at what happened on the uh, high yield, um, same asset class, but high yield uh, uh, ETFs, the opposite happened. Volume spiked. What that means is people who are fearful of holding this asset class, they're able to stump it as a basket, right? 
They may not get the price they, they like, but at least you're able to, ETF offers a, a venue to exit. So in that case, ETF actually acts as a liquidity buffer in a stressful period. Okay, now Todd, uh, let's talk about the mutual fund and ETF. This is a debate. You actually have, you know, you cover both and you made the cases for mutual funds. Here's a chart I just want to show. This is a, a study out of Germany where they, they found that people who were using ETFs at retail, uh, that, they, that part of their account performed a little worse than the mutual fund side because they tended to trade a little more. So just talk about the importance of behavior in using ETFs, because just because you can get out at 2 in the afternoon or you know, uh, whenever you want, the, how that might not be a good idea. Yeah, I mean, so ETFs are increasingly being used as a replacement for individual stocks. Traders are going to trade. And there's a number of firms that have business models that are encouraging you to trade uh, actively uh, you know, and do that. You're going to use ETFs. You're going to have the same experience the more frequently you trade an ETF as you are a stock. There's going to be costs related to that, whether there's, even if it's on a commission-free program, that's available. So, but, we'll, but the data that we've seen from other sources is that ETFs are being held for the long term. You know, I think on, on your podcast, you had uh, somebody from an asset, you know, a brokerage firm that also had that, that it's two years or three years for, for many folks that are, I don't want to name the player unless you want to, Fidelity. on it. OK, not my program, his program. That is happening. He basically said the average holding period of an ETF was two years. This was to combat Bogle, who will use the average volume. And then he'll say, well, everybody must be trading. But the fact is that number is definitely pushed up by big, frequent traders and overshadows the buy and hold. Right. So SPY is being traded. The triple Qs is being traded. But there's a lot of products that there's just being held onto for a long time. And, and they're being used in asset allocation vehicles as a replacement for mutual funds or as a replacement for individual securities. If you are a long-term investor from an asset allocation perspective, the ETF works just as well, if not better. But it's not necessarily a replacement. You want to trade. It's available to you. You want to hold it for the long term. It's available to, for you as well. Looks like we've got Yeah, it's happening in that space. That we haven't done it exhaustive. We haven't done it exhaustive. It's happening in high yield. It's happening in small caps as well. Uh, exposure to the Russell 2000 is what's there. So it's a lot easier if you run a mutual fund. Rather from a than closing, they want to keep bringing the assets. So let's just buy an ETF. You know, if, they, if there's not enough stocks. That's part of it. The other part of it is money is also ready to walk out the door, or they're afraid of money walking out the door. And so it's a lot easier to have two or three percent in that ETF vehicle as a way to handle cash flow, either before putting money to work into the individual securities or to be prepared to sell it and get out with a very tight spread that's happening. So it's definitely happening across the board. Yeah. Well, let me just take a crack at this real quick. XIV, SVXY, all told, have 0.1% of all ETF assets. Most of it's plain vanilla stuff. The second thing is, it's unfortunate, and there are dangerous products. I, I personally think they need like a movie-like rating system to keep uh, investors you know, away from rated R ETFs, um, because that you can get hurt. Now, Reggie, I guess you'd be good to ask, um, why are all these products existed? Like, I think that XIV is a case where a lot of people go, why did this even ever get approved? 
it's too small to have a systemic risk, okay? It's just too small. But it is not, it's dangerous enough to hurt a few people. Well, I think education. <clears throat> well, hold on. Well, I think uh, first, education is important. Reading investment materials, prospectus is absolutely necessary. And in this case, the prospectus was quite clear about how that structure was developed and how it was supposed to operate. And so to categorize all ETFs as much as mass destruction or just dangerous, I mean, I was part of development of the bank loan series, all of them. Uh, when BKLN came out first and the other four behind that. And that was controversial at the time. And so you have uh, uh, different types of investors who want exchange traded listed type product to reduce counterparty risk for S allocation. And that's why it's here. There are people who trade vol for a living. The options market is, is much larger than the corporate equity market. And there's people who trade it. So I think that Education is important. Understand why you want to, to have that exposure and how it operates. And to categorize it as dangerous, I'll take you to task on that because you got to read. And if you read, you understand. And if I just add to that. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I think part of what got investor attention on that is because volatility was so low, it was performing very well. Perfect example of you would never drive a car just using the rearview mirror. You should not buy any investment slowly looking backward. You'd have to look forward. Yeah. Yeah, also, people took cash off XIV. It had negative outflows its career. In other words, people were taking money. Not everybody lost. Um, and the second thing is you also have to understand that, and I see this all the time every day, the media, I call it the 95-5 principle. 95% of the coverage is on stuff that would be 5% of your portfolio. The stuff that's 95% of your portfolio is just too boring to get any ink, but that's where all the assets are, and that's I fight that all the time, but that is also- talking about things. reporters that don't work at Bloomberg. He's yeah. talking about every other- Not, not every reporters other, every other work place. at Bloomberg. The Bloomberg Question reporters are awesome. Somebody else- Shout out to them yeah, in the yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm the same way. I, I, I think for the most part, ETFs are like, you know, stock equities, you know, and Yeah, I, I, th this is what I like to add. An another category of uh, ETFs that could be potentially misunderstood and potentially dangerous is what you're saying, inverse and leverage ETFs. I actually did a comprehensive study. Uh, it just got published uh, last week on Journal of Index Investing. I look at over globally, right, not only leverage and ETF uh, inverse list in this country, but in other countries like Japan, big markets for, for, for those products, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and, and, and Canada, right? I find overwhelmingly the same conclusions, right? Uh, when, you use, when you use multiple, when you use a leverage product, whether it's inverse or, or, or long uh, direction, the multiplier typically is a good indicator of uh, the, the, vo the volatility, uh, the, the volatility of, of, of its one-time product right, over a long period of time. But those products are typically and meant to use for a week, right? 10 days, right? So, so then I look at 10 day volatility of two times, three times. Overwhelmingly, their short term volatility is much higher than two times and three times of 1x. So, this is something that I think, you know, you, you have back to Reggie's, right? You gotta understand, right? You, you gotta understand what, what, what you're using. Read the prospectus and do some analysis. If that's too hard for you, Higher uh, professional. Well, I'll tell you, if, if you guys have terminals, we have a traffic light system. All those are red light. It's easy. It's red. It's dangerous. Uh, and then we have yellow and green for the uh, different ones. I'd just but add, just finally, oh. I mean, just if, if, if you want to really learn about a product, call the issuer. We want to talk to you, right? Like, we want to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably no, true. No. Yeah. Well, 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 the guy in the target should have access to professional asset managers, right? Like many hey, the guy at Target has a good story to tell. Okay. Yes, he does. All right, we have to end it. I'm sorry, we're, we're way over. They've been telling me for five minutes now. So <laughs> let's give our panelists a nice round of applause. Thank you.